For my 20% time project, I am to program a voxel game engine from scratch using OpenGL and C++. My goal was to have procedural infinite terrain generation and the ability to place and break these voxel blocks similar to the famous game Minecraft. To do this, I first had to get something drawn to the screen. While this might seem trivial, I chose the more difficult path of doing all the rendering on a low level for, for better performance, instead of uh, letting a game engine such as Unity handle all of the graphics itself. After several hours of setting up an OpenGL context with GLFW, I was eventually able to render a triangle to the screen. After this, I learned about shaders, programs which run on the GPU that shade the scene that the player sees. With this, I was able to render multicolored and textured triangles. From here, I made the scene uh, three-dimensional by transforming vertices, points that define the bounds of polygons, from world space to screen space. This was done by multiplying the 3D positions of the vertices by the model, view, and projection matrices, calculated from the camera's three orthogonal directional vectors and its position. But there's one clear problem. The cube looks horribly unrealistic due to the lack of realistic lighting. To solve this issue, the following lighting model combines ambient, diffuse, and specular lighting for a more true-to-life result. It also allows for customizable materials, directional and point light sources, and lighting maps. The next step was to load models and meshes into the scene that could be created with other software. Although this was not essential for the finished product, I had fun designing my own asteroid model in Blender. I then added a cube map or skybox to the scene, as well as support for sorted accurate transparency. More importantly, I was able to get face calling working successfully, which looks at uh, the winding order of vertices on the screen to occlude polygons facing away from the camera. By doing so, faces that the camera cannot normally see are not drawn, drastically improving performance. Finally, to improve the graphics somewhat, I opted for the newer Blindfong lighting model and applied gamma correction uh, for more accurate colors. At this point, I was ready to start working on the actual engine itself, so I tried to render an array of different colored cubes to the screen via instancing. As with most first rendering tests, it was almost comically incorrect. Without going into too much detail, the problem was that I was not specifying the number of times each color and array should be used for each instance of an object. Fortunately, there was a simple solution to this, and I was able to make it work successfully. I then re-added the Blindfong lighting model, though this did not work on the first attempt either. A GUI, I'm GUI in this case, was implemented to make the customization of these blocks and light sources easier. However, there is a major issue with the way I was currently storing the positions, of the, uh, uh, the positions and data of the blocks. I was simply keeping the models of the blocks and their corresponding colors in an array, which was uploaded to the GPU every frame. If you've ever played Minecraft, you might know that the game splits up its world into chunks, 16 by 16 by 256 volumes of blocks that extend out to the world borders in their positive and negative x and z directions, but are limited in height. I decided to make my chunks 32 blocks across in each direction and tessellate space in all three dimensions, not just X and Z. This potentially allows for structures and terrain that are infinite in width, length, and height, as can be seen by these chunk borders. This is where I ran into my first challenge, storing the chunks. My first idea consisted of a, of a dynamic 3D array which expanded and rearranged pointers to the chunks as the bounds of the chunks grew. An array such as this, where elements need to be persistently inserted into the array, calls for lots of sifting of data around internally though, which is not great for performance. I learned this a difficult way after realizing that the program would freeze for hundreds of milliseconds when the array of chunks became sufficiently large enough. I found that the best solution was to use an unordered map which organizes key value pairs of the chunks and their positions into buckets internally, potentially having O and access time. With this in mind, I started working on the algorithm to generate meshes or collections of primitives composed of vertices for each chunk. This algorithm loops for every block in a chunk and adds a face for each face on a block uh, to the mesh's vertex buffer object if the face is not obscured by another opaque block. As can be seen by this wireframe mesh, the faces on the inside of the blocks are not being rendered, nor should they normally be seen by the camera, as are the back-facing faces. Again, the first tests were quite glitchy, but after fixing a number of bugs, there could be multiple chunks. With this engine working, I could finally begin creating a game of sorts. To start off, I wrote my own Perlin noise function that could procedurally generate realistic and natural terrain with multiple octaves layered on top of each other. Here is my first attempt at infinite terrain. Obviously, there were some issues with it that needed to be fixed, one of which being the way that the computer generated the terrain. The problem was that it was rendering the scene and loading the chunks both on the main thread, leading to lag spikes whenever chunks were created. To solve this, I had to create the data on a separate thread and load it in every frame on the main thread to improve performance. The next feature I was particularly excited about, which was transparent voxels. To implement this, all I had to do was add all the transparent vertices at the end of the buffer object so the transparent faces would be rendered after the opaque ones. This allowed me to incorporate translucent, translucent aqua-colored water into my terrain generation. As some last minute features, I added collision detection and the ability to place or break blocks where the player is looking. That being said, here's the finished result.
In the end, I did meet my goal of creating a voxel game without the help of a game engine. Overall, I'm thankful that I devoted 20% of my class time to a topic I found to be both intriguing and a learning experience.